So on page 41, we're talking about surface area, arc length, uh, uh, applications of integration is really what we're getting into, uh, applying the stuff that we've learned and also expanding upon it. So uh, arc length. Arc length is, well, the length of the arc, but there's a lot more to it than that. Well, that didn't end up the way I wanted it to. So what we can do, uh, and this doesn't look like much of a function over here, so let me just trim that is we can kind of do something along the lines of what we did back when we were learning about uh, slopes of secants and tangent lines and things like that and that is create an arbitrary graph and select some arbitrary points on said arbitrary graph all right uh, that moved on me so what I'm going to do is plot a point here at location a and I'm going to plot a point here at location B. Now, one way in which you could determine the length of the arc, all right, well, really what it's talking about is measuring using linear units the distance between two points on a curve. All right, so one way to do that would be to grab a ruler and measure each linear piece. So here's, here's my ruler. Oh, that's not going to look good. So measure this, get a distance, then, you know, turn it a little bit. Eh, maybe not quite like that. Turn it, get a distance. Turn it, get a distance. Oh, we're a little off, so turn it get a distance, turn it, get a distance, turn it, get a distance. Bet you can't guess what I'm gonna say next. Turn it and get a distance, and then turn it, get a distance, and then add it all up in the end, all right? So that's one way to do it. And if, you're, if your elementary school was anything like mine, there was, a, there was a point in time when you were learning about how to, how to read a map where maybe you did that. Uh, if we used index cards. Well, not index cards. We used sides of paper. Actually, it might have been index cards. But um, we used a side of a piece of paper, and we just measured little and made little tick marks. I don't know why I'm gesturing in the air with my hands. Um, we made little tick marks, and then uh, we just measured the distance of all of our tick marks, and that gave us a distance which we compared to the scale on the map and that told us how far it was between New York and Cleveland you know and so you do it that way that's one way to do it uh, another way to do it is kind of it's still in the spirit of that but it's not quite that all right obviously it's going to involve integration because what the heck have we been doing all semester you know so it's really a question of okay, well, how how are we gonna, how how are we going to get integration involved in this this seemingly unrelated to integration concept? All right. So what we do is we take an infinitesimal we're used to that term by now, I think infinitesimal distance on our graph and pretend this is infinitesimal. All right and we take that out of the graph, kind of pull it off on the side, and decompose it into horizontal and vertical components. All right. Now, that's not my best work not my worst work either so I mean it's really just kind of crapshoot but what I'll do actually is I'll, I'll zoom in on this and show you really what we're looking at all right so those distances 
are on the infinitesimal level. All right. So normally we would say, you know, if we were going from one point to another, I mean, just think about it, you know, way back in geometry or even before that, you'd have some distance that you probably didn't call S, but let's say you did. You'd have some horizontal distance and some vertical distance that made up or was the decomposition of that diagonal distance S. All right, so you have your X and your Y. That would give you, through the Pythagorean theorem, X squared plus Y squared is equal to S squared. All right, but now that's not really X and Y, right? Because if this were X and Y, we'd be looking at something over here, right? Starting at the origin, going to the right X units and going up Y units or down, you know, depending on if it's positive or negative. So this isn't really X and Y, but it is some sort of change in X and Y, so we'll put a little delta in front of it, capital delta. All right, and so what we're dealing with here, that S wouldn't be related necessarily to the origin, all right? It would be related to the change in X and change in Y. So we'll call that delta S, all right? Just to keep it consistent with the notation used for the decomposition, all right? So by the Pythagorean theorem, by the power of grayskull, I can now look at this as saying delta x squared, delta y squared, and delta s squared. All right, capitals all the way. All right, you probably did something like this when you were talking about the slope of the secant line. Because slope of the secant line is really just the change in y over change in x, which is what you would get if you took some line segment connecting two points and decomposed it into its horizontal and, and vertical components and found the rate of change or the change in y over change in x. All right, same idea. It's just we kind of deviated from that. All right, so what now? Well. We just figured out what it what it was on the macro level, so now let's figure it out on the micro level. All right, so shift it on over here. We're talking about some infinitesimal change in X. Infinitesimal, we use a lowercase delta. Some infinitesimal change in Y, we use a lowercase delta, and so infinitesimal change in S, lowercase delta associated with the S. All right, now, I mean, we, we just tend to say DS just because it's, I mean, you saw how much trouble I had making those deltas just now. Uh, that should be a Y. Now, when you get to Calc 3, you'll see that there, there is a need to incorporate the Greek notation, um, the, the deltas, but until you get there, you can kind of, kind of cut corners a little bit, as they say. I don't know who they are, but they say it. By golly, they say it. All right, so what I'm going to do now is use this relationship. Surprise, surprise. Dx, dy, ds is going to follow, or it will follow, that dx squared plus dy squared is equal to ds squared. All right, so that's, that's wonderful news. What do we do with it? Well, I can can like solve for ds, I guess. Well, let's do that. All right, so 
if I were to do that, I'd take the square root. That that seems like a disaster waiting to happen. So actually, why don't I why don't I see if I can clean it up first? Well, I can divide everything, and this is me trying to play coy as if I don't know where this is going. Um, it's an investigation. We're going to discover. It's a journey, right? It's more like um, a derivation. I know exactly where it's going, and and you do too. Just look down. You know, it's there. There are rules, All right? So we're going to divide everything by dx squared. All right, because I'm just thinking about the functions that we might be given, and. The bottom line is, if you're given a function like y equals, I can figure out something like dy dx. It's going to be pretty tricky for me to figure out something like dx or ds. You know, so we, we just figure, or we, we set it up to give us the thing that we know we can figure out, if that makes any kind of sense whatsoever. All right, so at least that's what I'm going for, you know, trying to make sense. So we're going to get a 1 plus, uh, this I could write as dy dx squared, as is the case over here, I can write this as ds dx squared. Now I can, in good conscience, take the square root, And we would get, well, the left-hand side is going to stay as is. The right-hand side is now just going to become a ds dx. But we could do more. Well, this is a differential equation. If I multiply both sides by dx, I now have ds equal to all of this dx. So that gives me an infinitesimal distance. Infinitesimal distance between two infinitesimally separated points. All, all wonderful. I can integrate. If I integrate this, I'll get S on the left-hand side is equal to, now it just depends on where I'm integrating it from and to. So I'll integrate from some starting point A to some ending point B. And if I integrate all of those little infinitesimal distances, what I'll end up with will be the arc length from the beginning to the end of that interval. All right. And so that's the, that's the origin story behind the arc length formula. These formulas into action uh, the first example, find the length of the arc of the graph of y equals the natural log of cosine of x on the interval of 0 to uh, pi over 4. All right, so I can create the graph. Natural log of cosine of x, get rid of the other function, on the interval of 0 to pi over 4. little nifty trick if you put in your domain and it doesn't always play out especially with transcendental functions but when it does it's, it's kind of nice it's a nice little hack um, go to after you put your domain in for x min x max go to y min or y max hit clear and then zoom zero zoom fit and it'll give you what the calculator thinks is the best range for the domain that you stated all right, and then you can go back in and take a look and see if that makes sense. So at least it gives you a place to start. So I'm, I'm more inclined to say, all right, well, let's make this negative 0.5. I like to see the x-axis and the y-axis, so I'm going to plot just a little bit south of 
well, I guess west of the x-axis, negative 0.1, and a little bit north of the y-axis, just so you can see what's going on there. All right. So what I'm looking for is the length of the curve over this interval. All right. So, you know, if, if you had to come up with an estimate, you know, you might get close, but I don't think you're going to get, I mean, if you're just ballparking it, I don't think you're going to get too much accuracy without using a formula. All right. So what we'll use is, uh, you know, the, the formula we just came up with. So now there's two variations, the one with the dy dx that we derived, and then there's the one with uh, f prime of x either way. Since the equation is given in the form of y equals, we'll use dy dx. And I'm going to use a thicker marker. So dy dx is going to be equal to 1 over the cosine of x multiplied by the derivative of cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. So we're looking at negative tangent of x. Okay, so the integral over the interval of 0 to pi over 4 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared, so negative tan x quantity squared under that radical dx. All right, so this is what we have to integrate. Now, again, just like the volumes, you can do it by hand, you can do it in the calculator, it's up to you, all right? Preference would be to the calculator. Sometimes you want to clean it up a little bit just to make it a little bit easier to type into the calculator. So this is one plus tangent squared, all right? So if you remember your Pythagorean identities, so sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one, but one of the variations on that, if you divide everything by cosine, is tangent squared plus one is equal to secant squared. All right, so this is one plus tangent squared, you know, the negative notwithstanding, because it's raised to a power of two, this is gonna give you a secant squared x dx, so it's actually going to be pretty easy to do by hand. Normally I would say, you know, forget it, just do it in the calculator. Um, but here we want to do it by hand. I don't know why I wrote a pi over 2. Classic Bob. Oh, I almost wrote another pi, so this is, this is derailing very quickly. All right, so from 0 to pi over 4, secant x dx. Now at this point it's just a question of, all right, well, do you want to put it in the calculator? If so, at least you have something easier to type in. If you're doing it on a TI, you type it in as one over cosine, but on the on Desmos, you could type it in as secant. All right. But if you remember, the antiderivative of secant is the natural log of secant x plus tangent of x. Now this is integrated over the interval of zero to pi over four. Be careful for domain issues because we know that secant and tangent functions are undefined for certain values of x. All right, um, the, the ordinary parent function is only undefined uh, for multiples of pi over two. So we're good to go there. Still looks a little wonky, but I'm gonna live with it. So going from zero to pi over four is okay. So we're looking at the natural log of secant pi over 4 plus tangent pi over 4 minus the natural log of secant 0 plus tangent 0. All right, tangent of 0 is equal to 0, so that's going to go away. Secant of 0 is equal to 1. All right, and that's because cosine of zero is equal to one, reciprocal of one is one. All right, so natural log of one is zero. So this whole thing is actually gonna go away. All right, so as it turns out, not, not a guarantee, but in this case, it works out that way. So ln of, well, the reciprocal of cosine at pi over four,
cosine pi over four is rad two over two, but the unrationalized version of that is one over rad two. The reciprocal of one over rad two is rad two. Tangent of pi over four is one. And so we're looking at the natural log of radical two plus one guaranteed to be positive, both values are positive, so we could say the natural log of radical two plus one, not that it really makes a difference, but that would be our final answer in exact form. All right, so let's get a look at that in decimal form. So about 0.881, all right, so I'll do a math nine from zero to pi over four. Putting in 1 over cosine of x dx. And you get the same decimal, so we know we're in pretty good shape here. And uh, if you wanted to go to Desmos, this is from earlier. Antiderivative 0 to pi over 4 of the trig function, where are you? Secant of x, close it up, dx, and you get the same decimal. All right, we could put a more unsimplified form in there, but I don't wanna take too much time with that. All right, the next one, find the length of the arc of the graph on the interval of 0.5 to two. And right, it's the same general idea. Uh, first, I'm gonna clean it, clean it up a little bit y equals one over six x to the third plus well the other one you can kind of leave as is you know but i'm going to write it as one half x to the negative first you know because if you know the derivative of one over x you know most people are kind of you know muscle memory it's negative x to the negative second you just kind of kind of work off of that but you could also write it in power form so you make it easier to differentiate so dy dx, one half x to the second minus one half x to the negative second. All right, so this one, we're, we're going from 0 0.5 to two, one plus this whole thing squared. I hit cut when I meant to hit copy. That's all right, easy fix. This whole thing squared, the whole shebang under the radical dx, and that's going right into a calculator. And again, like I said, it doesn't matter which calculator you go with. All right, it's a matter of preference. I'm gonna see about making this a little slimmer so it fits nicer. Function, miscellaneous. 0 0.5 or just 0.5 if you want to. The radical, well, you know what? I, I get a little nervous about the parentheses, so I'm just gonna put it in. One plus another set of parens, I'll write it as 0.5 x squared minus 0.5 x raised to the negative second close it up and square it, then close it up and slap on a dx, and you get about, you get exactly 2.0625, which presents a fraction option, so I'm gonna take that, 33 over 16. Now in both cases, we're looking at linear units, all right, whether it's number one or number two. So going back to number one, this was about 0.881. All right, so this is units, not units squared, not units cubed, just units. All right, if they gave you the units, you'd use whatever they are, like inches, feet, miles, whatever. But here we would just say units. 